Bonsoir, good afternoon. Euh, bon après-midi, good afternoon everyone. Euh, je, je crois qu'on va faire la, la session en français. Mais... Ok, la session sera en français, mais bien sûr, elle sera traduite et à la fin, vous pourrez vous poser vos questions en anglais si vous voulez. So feel free. We're going to try and have as, uh, an, as an interactive session as much as possible. We're still waiting for someone from the OECD who's the Director of Statistics and Chief Statistician. She'll join us in a few minutes, but I'm very delighted to uh, welcome Jean Tirole, who belongs to a very limited circle. Uh, namely that uh, of uh, the Nobel Prize uh, winners uh, uh, who are also authors of bestsellers and uh, the economics for the common good has been translated into many languages soon will be translated into Chinese it's a fantastic book I'm sure lots of uh, you have read it and uh, this is a book that never leaves my bedside and I, I look at it very often uh, so I would like to start with uh, the, the news, the current news, because we're going to be discussing quite a number of topics from the beginning of uh, the crisis in the Eurozone. We'll be talking about uh, the development in employment, the impact of uh, technology on the workplace. We'll be talking about uh, free trade, about uh, uh, trade issues. Emmanuel Macron has just discussed these questions, the inequalities that uh, grow. Uh, you'll tell us what you think about this. But so, so there'll be a multiplicity of topics, but I would start with the, the, the current news that our neighbors in Italy who have uh, who are trying to uh, um, make, organize a government, uh, but it's uh, something that's pretty difficult. And behind what's just happened during the elections in Italy, there are, of course, all of these questions, all of the fears uh, that uh, uh, arise uh, in a greater part of the population because of the way the economic uh, economics work today, the, the fear of globalization. Uh, uh, and this is a fear that is not n only present in Italy. It's, uh, it's to be found in a number of other developed countries, of course, sometimes at a higher level the, to, than in Italy. So uh, let's first talk about this, what's currently happening in Italy and the fears that people have with regards how the uh, economics uh, factors work. Well, how do you see things? Well, first of all, good afternoon to all, and thank you for uh, discussing these things with me today. It's very worrying indeed because uh, some time ago we thought that Europe uh, was uh, had, had made it basically and the uh, countries in the south, uh, Greece, uh, Spain, Portugal made great efforts. There's uh, also world economic growth that is pulling things upwards and we were very confident on what was going to happen. But the fundamentals are still here. And I can see two or three of those. Uh, the first one is what you've just mentioned, the fears, the frustrations. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, they, they're not that recent. There was a 2008 crisis. There was the European crisis. Uh, there was, there's the uh, uh, growth in inequality, uh, the uh, problems related to uh, globalization and also related to uh, technological progress. And we also have fears with the future, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, climate change, and so on. So all of the uh, peoples uh, in the world are, uh, feel some kind of frustration and fear. And it's a bit paradoxical, really, because on the other hand, we're much richer, we're in better health. Uh, uh, but in Italy, just like uh, everywhere else, the populists are are, are, are really feeding on, on this happily, and they're they're uh, they're suggesting uh, some real uh, panaceas uh, to cure all of this, and they know how to uh, play with our. Uh, cognitive uh, um, faiths and beliefs uh, because uh, we are afraid of the future and therefore people who propose uh, uh, cure cures for this become uh, popular and uh, all of they're playing with the cognitive goods uh, so they're, they're, they're feeding uh, 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 from this, but they're also feeding on the fear and the f fears and the frustrations. Now, in Italy, uh, the debt level is very high. There's there's a major is a, they're in the worrying environment and. 
uh, uh, and Italy, like anywhere else uh, in Europe, we have this vicious circle between the banks and the states. Uh, in other words, uh, if we have a, a downgrading of uh, the sovereign state, the uh, uh, Italian banks uh, who have uh, lots of non-performing loans uh, will uh, see their accounts deteriorate as well because uh, the Italian uh, debt decreases in price and uh, the Italian state will therefore have to possibly fund the banks and which will also uh, let lead to a, a decrease in the sovereign debt uh, level and so on and so uh, so it's really a vicious circle which is linked to the uh, re-segmentation of the financial markets uh, since 2010-2011, uh, which means that we are taking lots of risks. I mean, we didn't want to take action against this in Europe. Uh, uh, lots of economists discussed this. There was a lot of academic research on this topic. I did that too. Uh, but for the moment, it did not have much of an impact. And it's true that there is a transition period. Now, if the Italian debt is risky, uh, there's no reason why the banks should take long-term risks uh, while, you know, uh, claiming that they, they or, or, or uh, uh, pretending that it's not risky. Uh, but then, uh, this, uh, but, the, but, but if we, uh, uh, th this might lead to uh, additional difficulties in the country. So I hope that we will uh, learn from this. Uh, because it's a very dangerous situation. Well, before we come back to the uh, Eurozone crisis, uh, you mentioned the downgrading. Now, is this just a, a feeling or is this a reality? Well, it's a reality because uh, increasing an increasing number of uh, uh, studies by economists uh, have uh, shown uh, in the U.S., in Germany, in Scandinavia, have shown that there are people who are in pain. The pie is going big, is growing bigger, but uh, it's uh, not shared uh, fairly. There are people who lose their job and who don't find an equivalent job in their region because jobs are being created elsewhere. It's not that we're missing jobs worldwide, but the problem is that you have to find a similar job in your in your area uh, and also also in your field of competence. Uh, and so what could be the responses to this? Uh, because uh, we, we, we see, uh, well, as you're saying, that this is a reality, that this is uh, something which uh, is uh, massively observed in many countries. Well, how can we all respond to this? Well, in the short term, it's difficult. I mean, they could be a safety net uh, to uh, uh, make the landing a little bit less uh, painful. This is done uh, in the Western European countries. In the US, it's very difficult. But you see populism, uh, which is increasing even in areas where this problem is not known. So it's a more general problem, more so than the simple downgrading. But the, we have the winners of uh, globalization who adapt very well to the new situation and the, the others uh, who are suffering from it with the disappearance of the middle classes. Uh, and it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen. But there's a, a chance that this might go on, actually. And then what should we do? Well, you have to have a safety net. That's the first thing. And then secondly, you have to give an education to people, uh, uh, primary, secondary, and uh, university levels, uh, higher education, so that people can adapt afterwards, uh, because uh, they have to be able to change jobs easily. Uh, and uh, there has to be a lot of vocational training uh, as well. And uh, in uh, both cases in our country here, we, we're not doing a good job. Well, the question that a lot of people are asking themselves in uh, the e developed economies is, uh, is this uh, uh, downgrading something, a fatality, I mean, for, for, for rich and developed countries? Well, we don't really know, actually, how this is going to uh, turn out. We see a lot of people whose uh, job simply disappears. We're talking about globalization, but artificial intelligence or technological progress uh, also plays a very big role, even an even bigger role. So it might actually, I mean, we can try and slow down this phenomenon, but it's going to be, uh, to be with us. Uh, so which jobs are going to disappear, we don't really know, actually. We can possibly project things uh, in the five or ten years to come, for instance, uh, cab drivers might uh, lose their job because of the self-driving cars or whatever. But it's very, very difficult to actually predict this. We don't really know where technology is heading. And so that's why we have to have a lot of vocational training, so as to prepare people well. But to what, we don't know. Uh, you, you, you may also in the future have educated people who lose their job. 
Well, for you, this process is therefore uh, necessarily something that's going to be negative in the in the future because I mean you are being very pessimistic it seems to me well the the, the problem I mean I mean for, for the past 200 years we've been predicting a loss of jobs but uh, we uh, 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 and we've been saying that there won't be enough jobs but it, we've always been wrong uh, but it's a question of you know whether people can accept uh, the, uh, other jobs, whether it's below their dignity, uh, are these uh, going to be good jobs or more robust jobs, uh, or, or, or or below their dignity job? But but the thing is, you know, with the development of artificial intelligence, uh, uh, not a number of jobs will disappear, but uh, it's going ever faster now. Now, compared to the uh, development on the uh, employment market, do you think that the overall uh, legal framework, uh, labor law, and so on, is uh, uh, sufficient today Do, uh, uh, does uh, can can europe uh, defend its model or should we go towards more liberalization when we see the the, the damages uh, that this might generate in countries like the us for instance so where do you think uh, we should stand or should we have more li liberalization or should we have uh, more security, should we have more training? Well, there are three solutions. Either you protect uh, employment, which is what we do in the southern European countries, or you protect uh, the employee in northern Europe, or, or you uh, protect no one, and that's what is done in the US. So uh, the American solution doesn't seem to be the optimal solution to me for obvious reasons, because uh, uh, but w we we need to be uh, resistant to technological shocks, and, and again, it's not the employee's fault if he's going to lose his job. So uh, then you can, of course, uh, protect the, the 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 job itself. But we've already seen the limits to this in southern Europe with lots of unemployment and also bad jobs, you know, the, those uh, short-term uh, jobs uh, uh, where you don't get a good training and where it's really a temporary uh, job which will result in unemployment. So these are not good jobs. And uh, for open-ended contracts, there are issues relating to mobility of the employees. Uh, uh, the companies would like to adjust, but it's difficult, and employees sometimes would like to find another open-ended contract, but they can't. Uh, so uh, that's a, a, another challenge. But so uh, uh, I, I don't think, again, that this is optimal. Uh, and it's going to have a stronger impact in the future because the, the nature of jobs is going to change ever faster. We're going to have lots of uncertainties on jobs, and therefore companies will be even more reluctant than today to generate uh, durable jobs. Now, there should not be two short-term jobs because it's, it's stupid to take someone on if you know uh, in advance that you're going to lay off this person, even though the person might be, uh, might be very satisfactory. So we have to uh, be much more flexible, and we have to protect the employees. Now, let's look at some at, at a practical case. Let's take the case of a small economy, the French economy. The, uh, uh, are the structures, uh, the, the legal structures, uh, labor law structures in France, uh, are they uh, are following the reforms that we've seen? Are they uh, suited to the current environment, or do you think that there, there should be further reform? You don't necessarily have to answer this, because it's a political question. Well, I won't answer on the political side, of course. But I won't venture there. Uh, but uh, we should uh, revamp uh, uh, vocational training. I mean, the, the, I mean, vocational training has been taken back by by the by the government. It's uh, 31 billion uh, euros a year. Uh, so the state has uh, to have a say there, and it should not be the, the social partners involved uh, there only. And then there's one major person, uh, and then, then one, one point which is absent from these reforms. I mean, uh, uh, if you want to give uh, flexibility to companies, they ha also have to be made liable, and, and uh, uh, we, ha we know how to make them liable. 
they should uh, uh, pay part of the uh, unemployment costs that they uh, generate when they lay off uh, a, a worker. So there should be a, a, a bonus m m system uh, where uh, the, the, the reward or disincentive system, which is a very simple economic mechanism uh, that, that should be put in place. Well, this is something that we have in the U.S., but does it really work? Well, in the U.S., it was introduced by Roosevelt. and. Uh, uh, this uh, had to do with very short uh, job insurance uh, or unemployment insurance. And traditionally, there has been not, not a lot of unemployment. So it's not the same topic. And there's, but there's a transition issue here, which is very complex. Uh, but uh, uh, this was also uh, introduced modestly, something similar in Italy. Uh, the Spa uh, Spain is uh, envisaging t uh, implementing it as well. And why not? I mean, because I think that this uh, uh, reward or disincentive system uh, would be good, and this would uh, put an end to the negotiated. Uh, um, termination of contracts uh, where people don't really pay for the consequences uh, of their actions. So uh, so we should not have laissez-faire. We should have a market where people should be really made responsible vis-a-vis -vis the consequences of their actions. For instance, you would not imagine uh, the for the uh, companies to uh, produce um, uh, solar power to pay the, the carbon tax for those that uh, use coal. Uh, and it's a bit surprising that we've uh, gotten to that point. <laughs> uh, and uh, I know that there are a number of social players who are still opposed to uh, this type of measure, but I think that would be good uh, in terms of the, uh, from the reform standpoint. Martin Durand, we are absolutely delighted to welcome you. Yes, I was in the room with Mr. Macron, and uh, we have uh, also the signature of the two new countries joining OECD. It was a little bit difficult to just walk out on them. So anyway, you're in charge of uh, statistical operations here at OECD. You're an economist, and you have an OECD approach on all of these uh, international global issues. Yes, and obviously I've arrived right in the middle of the conversation. You may have dealt with this already, but I had a question for Jean Tirol, if you'll allow. Now, you, the theme of the ministerial and of the forum is uh, inclusive and sustainable growth. Now, of course, this is uh, uh, directly uh, related to the economy of the common good. Uh, it means putting uh, uh, people at the heart of uh, political issues. Uh, and what many have said, economists and others, is that uh, inequalities have increased uh, in the framework of uh, uh, fast-paced globalization technological change. And we know that uh, not only have inequalities uh, uh, increased in terms of income, but also the share of 1% uh, or 10% uh, have, uh, uh, has also uh, grown uh, exponentially as compared to that of the other. So what work of the OECD has demonstrated recently is that the systems of redistribution through taxation, uh, transfers, uh, no longer have the uh, power of redistribution. They no longer correct inequalities as much as they used to do. And what OECD is saying on the issue of inclusive growth in terms of uh, policy recommendations uh, and continued work is to say that uh, Naturally, we do need to continue to redistribute. Uh, that is not in question. We need to improve the uh, redistribution power of social transfers. But we should also avoid situations uh, of inequality uh, from the inception. We should deal with the root causes of inequality. We should deal with access to health, to quality education. and. Uh, these are social issues, but also ensure that in uh, the corporate world there is a share uh, between productivity and uh, salaries uh, which functions better because it doesn't seem to be going anywhere right now. So I wanted to know a little bit more about what you think concerning the root causes of inequalities and uh, from the point of view of the corporate world, from the point of view of access to the common 
good in the sense of health education and so on, and the whole redistribution system. Well, I, I'm not a specialist. It is true that OECD has been working on these issues, and you are right. Inequality is not only inequality of income, it's an inequality of opportunity, of health. And here in Europe, we can't much complain in terms of health. Uh, the United States, perhaps a bit more, the whole issue of Obamacare. Uh, and in, in many uh, countries, we have difficulties, uh, including in France, uh, uh, concerning that the increase in inequalities, uh, we're talking about 20% in, in France, the best uh, uh, trained and educated, well-educated, but uh, the, the the lowest 20% uh, 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 are in a very catastrophic situation. The people who've had a bad education is not their fault. And they have a lot of difficulties on the labor market. And uh, uh, they're not offered new training either because we're not using ongoing uh, training effectively. So there's major inequalities. And I agree with you. It's not sufficient to simply redistribute money, even though we should do that as well. But it's also a matter of dignity. Everybody wants to feel that they contribute to society, or at least the vast majority of people want to contribute to society. But there's also international mobility. There isn't a, a, an international agreement uh, on, on uh, tax issues for the usual reasons, which means that Sometimes uh, you tend to localize uh, profits in those countries where taxation is uh, uh, weakest. And it's very easy to do this with intellectual property and intangibles. And this has always existed, and it has become even easier than it used to be. And uh, then you have the issues of platforms, and how do you tax them? It's always possible to uh, put the highest price end of the range in, in, in Ireland or, 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 or elsewhere. So there are problems. And then you have mobility of elites. And let us state this frankly. Elites are international. They are citizens of the world, which is all well and good. Uh, but of course, they can uh, go out shopping and go to countries uh, where they get the best conditions, tax conditions. Uh, or uh, research conditions for researchers. It's not only a matter of money. Uh, if you can carry out certain experiences uh, in a given country rather than another, you get the best universities in another country. Uh, venture capital is good in one country and not in another. Uh, everybody speaks English now, and everybody feels a citizen of the world, and they, people tend to move around. And you can see this in academic uh, research, but also venture capital in many other fields. So. There are major issues, and today you look at the seven major corporations in the world. These are platforms that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. They've all been created in the United States or in China. And you look at uh, startups, Airbnb, uh, uh, or, or any other. It's, it's all the same. You look at mobility of intellectual elites. Uh, uh, it, it's amazing. So uh, redistribution is not the only solution, because the elites will simply move elsewhere. So. I think it's very different from when I started my career as an academic. I remember uh, after my PhD, I decided to work in France. Uh, I went onto the labor market. I really wanted to work in France. I had had uh, some uh, uh, disappointment uh, uh, with the way the labor market worked and research worked. And then I moved to the United States. And everybody was very surprised. Uh, there were a few examples before me. but. French elites simply didn't go elsewhere. They didn't migrate. Uh, nowadays, uh, if you haven't been to Berkeley, well, uh, but yeah, but you're talking about the mobility of elites. You, you, you say it's amazing, but what is the appropriate policy in such a situation? Are you advocating stopping elites from moving? Or are you simply saying that their own countries should become more attractive? What's the solution? Well, there isn't a good solution, but there are uh, uh, possible ideas. I have a lot of colleagues uh, in the United States who would be perfectly ready to come back to France if conditions were good. I'm not talking about financial conditions. People are willing to 
make a bit less money, not, not a lot less, but uh, they are willing to make an effort to live and contribute to their own country. But you also need governance, you need institutions, you need to make sure that universities are attractive, which is not the case today, to take just that example. Uh, an entrepreneur who uh, wishes to access uh, uh, subsidies from the French uh, uh, government uh, shouldn't be uh, able to sell off and move to Palo Alto when it's in best interest. You need a context of venture capital to ensure that companies can be created in France or elsewhere in Europe. So a bit of regulation and attractiveness as well. So we were talking, and Emmanuel Macron was uh, also mentioning it a moment ago, uh, all of the downsides of globalization, the increase in inequalities, which we've just mentioned, do you think we've reached a tipping point where globalization could start moving backwards? There is a strong temptation uh, we've seen this in the United States in particular. Have we reached that point in history where globalization could simply start uh, receding and countries uh, would close up again? Yes, we're getting back to our initial subject, aren't we? A lot of people believe or think, Italy, I gave that example, that this could help them solve Italian problems. We shall see. I, I, I'm not very good at forecasts, but... Uh, I am a little worried in what Donald Trump is doing right now. Well, I think we should have rule of law um, and to ensure that agreements are implemented. What will Donald Trump do? Save a few jobs left, right, and center and then destroy a whole other lot because of other companies that will be affected because their suppliers will not be providing uh, 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 their, uh, uh, the necessary goods at an acceptable price or uh, because others will um, take their revenge and set up their own uh, uh, tariffs and then uh, uh, there will be uh, uh, layoffs and uh, there will be creation of monopolies. But sooner or later it, it's going to turn negative uh, but won't it eventually uh, also have a positive side? Well, you can always say that uh, Italy uh, will uh, uh, make a mistake and then draw the lessons from that, but it's, it's probably a better way. What Macron was saying in the Secretary General before him, th there is a feeling that globalization has uh, pulled a lot of people out of poverty uh, around the world, uh, in, in China in particular the action of China, but a lot of people have been left by the wayside, and uh, this is what is expressed in populist vote. And it's not only poor people, it's the middle class as well. So it goes much further up uh, at the social scale. A lot of people have been affected, and this is a preoccupation uh, that uh, deserves a response. So you can always say the elites might leave the country. Yes, but they are working uh, in a factory about to close in uh, the US or, or, or France or elsewhere uh, in a region with major difficulties, we need, they need an answer. So you can talk about investing in education, uh, you, need, you can talk about polarization of the labor market uh, to invest in skills, but if you're 50 or 55 years old and you're suddenly unemployed, in a region that has been devastated uh, uh, by the number of companies moving out, well, you need an answer for that. Otherwise, you'll end up going where we seem to be going. And I agree with you. This is not the solution. Italy, th what they're thinking of is not the solution. And I do hope that th that's not where they'll go. But it's difficult. And we haven't yet found the right answer. But can we trust globalization when you see WTO is uh, malfunctioning, uh, that competition conditions are asymmetrical, thinking of China, that obviously is not opening its market as much as Europe or other countries? Well, obviously, you need to achieve a level playing field. But we're very far from that. Oh, yes, we're very far from that. But you need to work on uh, various fronts. You need to establish rules. 
it's not simply by locking yourself up uh, that you will find a solution. You need to continue discussion and improving rules. And you also need to do something about the people who've been left behind. You can't simply say globalization reduces poverty overall, globally, because people will say, but what about me? And this is a message that is no longer audible. Otherwise, you end up with what we're seeing now, the populist vote. And I think that we need to answer those questions. It is by dealing with the root causes of inequalities. But my question to you is, and, and possibly this is something that is uh, uh, in line with what you've been working on. We have seen here at OECD that with the digital digitalization, uh, with the new major digital groups, we get the feeling or at least this is what has appeared in, in our work, that this ha may also have led to increased inequalities in wages because some companies are highly productive. They attract the elites uh, that are well educated and pay them very well. But uh, uh, distribution somehow doesn't get any further, possibly because of value chains uh, uh, that uh, has uh, been completely transformed. So you have a complete polarization of the labor market. And it's very difficult to solve that issue. Do you have an opinion on that? Again, I'm not a specialist, but you're right. With globalization, uh, you have certain uh, very effective companies that are really benefiting. Be and, and, and on a global market, other uh, companies uh, are less effective, and they're vanishing, and they're suffering. Uh, and obviously, this has an automatic effect on the people who work for them. You have workers with uh, high skills uh, that uh, uh, are uh, 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 can go anywhere in the world uh, with a very high salary that rises exponentially. And uh, we've also seen the phenomenon of superstar companies. Uh, ob it's obvious in the digital world because of the network effect where companies have major market shares and the superstar companies and, and, and the highest increases are there. Amazon, Facebook, etc. Uh, you see uh, uh, capitalization increasing exponentially and obviously their workers as well as their owners are benefiting to a very great extent. And uh, what's been uh, interesting in recent work is that it's not only in the digital world. It happens elsewhere in other industries. So we don't have a full and complete theory to, to explain the phenomenon, but we can see the split between those companies that are doing very well indeed and those that are in difficulty. OK, any questions in the room? Let me open up the discussion. I don't know whether you have microphones in the room. Yes, the gentleman here. with a microphone for purposes of interpretation. The interpreters cannot hear the, the room without microphones. Now, Jean Tirole, you're an expert of economic incentive mechanisms, but why would you say that in the current debate we don't have uh, any indications of economic models and rules of the game that could lead us to a balance, a distribution of value in a negotiation that is something other than a balance of forces, uh, as you've indicated uh, by uh, mentioning the power of negotiation of major companies. Why uh, is this debate uh, uh, completely emptied of uh, this type of idea or content. We talk about value creation, but we don't explain by what miracle or alchemy the rules of the game that are not in non-existent today, not discussed, not even looked for, have not achieved the expected results. Well, you obviously have the uh, automatic market phenomenon with allocation of resources and uh, all countries live in market uh, economies today. So you have the forces at play in the 1970s. The uh, share of uh, added value uh, uh, had uh, uh, been included for uh, labor, and there was mechanization. And uh, 
that had a, an effect in France, so that the share of added value eventually went back to the way it was. It's very difficult to uh, fight against market forces. I think that if we're talking about uh, inefficiencies, uh, it's probably a better idea to redistribute income, which is important, but also other uh, social goods such as health, education, and so on. We all know the problem of redistribution. You would need an international agreement. I mean, it's like climate. And this is a major failure of geopolitics. We don't really know how to achieve harmonization of taxation or international agreements where uh, each uh, individual country isn't trying to get the best share of the deal. But mechanisms exist. Entrepreneurs in the United States or China create value. It's not only Google or Alibaba. You also have uh, uh, those who fail. Uh, but there is a strong incentive to uh, create companies and to create jobs. So maybe less jobs than in the past. A company like uh, Alibaba has 60,000 employees. It's the sixth company in the world. That's not many people working for the sixth uh, largest company in the world. <laughs> just, uh, just, uh, Let me just get back to jobs. Take Alibaba, for example, with uh, loans to micro loans to 8 million companies. That's been very effective. It takes one second to get an answer, to get a loan, uh, and to get the money if you get the loan, because it's artificial intelligence. It has been very useful. Because you have so many small companies that couldn't have access to credit, or even individuals, uh, selling uh, their uh, fruit and veg and can get a thousand, two thousand euros in one second. That's extraordinary. If you need to fill in a form, it takes three minutes. Job creation now in the Alibaba bank, so to speak, is zero because there's no single human individual involved. The case for companies to work more closely with the states. For example, we see the case of California. Uh, they've been, uh, you know, during the last few years, trying to expand their healthcare coverage. They've been trying to, like, uh, implement some uh, regulations to protect the environment, even, like, some... Uh, um, um, their educational system has been expanded to give the opportunity to people to have access to education. But, I mean, of course, like, for the state to afford this, they have to, like, increase some taxation, right? So, and then, like, some companies are moving out of the states, like, looking for better tax opportunities. So they go to Texas, for example, right? So, uh, so I mean, I feel like... Uh, when we have like these initiatives for a state to like reduce inequalities and all that, like the fact that you don't carry out that initiative like in a global way, basically end up like you know in this state failing, right? And then like sometimes like people are seeing or saying, oh, California, you did it uh, in a bad way. That was not the solution. Well, it's not necessarily that California was not the solution. It was that it had to be like a global uh, approach, right? So. What's your view on that? Like, what's the next step that we should, uh, companies and governments, have to carry out to solve that? Well, you are right. You are right to stress that you need a global approach because there are lots of uh, public goods to be supplied. And if you um, if take climate change, for example, okay, it's a good example. So, you know, you like the other countries to make the effort to reduce uh, carbon emissions, but at the same time. You, 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 know, you, you don't want to do it yourself because it's expensive. So you need a global agreement. And as, as you know, the global agreement, we don't quite have it. COP21 in Paris was very mild, a non-binding, very low ambition in the fact, no, not, not in the diagnostic, which was perfectly fine. 
but the problem is that we have 200 countries and you always would like the other country to do it. Um, and you can say the same thing for many things, either across countries, we were talking about taxation, for example, or within countries, you mentioned the case of the US, and if you, if you train people, for example, they might, with high mobility, they can move to another state, so what's your incentive to do that? And you know, again, there's, there's no other solution than, than basically multilateralism, because you know, in the end, it's always tempting to deviate. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a kind of prisoner's dilemma. It's always tempting to deviate and just uh, uh, expect the others to supply the public good, which are not going to supply anyway. Um, and that's why we, we have to take our responsibility you know, together. But for, for me, for this, of course, citizens have a big role to play because they, with their votes to some extent, right? I mean, uh, and that's what we see. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on climate and, and so on. So you, I mean, it's not just the, the governments are just a reflection of who has voted for them. So it's also the response. It's not just the responsibility of governments or the responsibility of, of business. It's also the responsibility of everyone. I, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, the, you know, one of the thing is that our democracies are as good as we are in a sense. And if we, you know, if uh, don't expect politicians to be extremely courageous. Some are more courageous than others. Some are brighter than others. You know, by by and large, they must be reacted. So if the if the public opinion doesn't understand what is at stake. Um, and we don't put pressure ourselves on our politicians. That's not going to happen by and large. And y you see that, you know, you see that with. Uh, let me go back to COP21. Everybody, everybody went back home saying we have won. Mm -hmm. Not a single chief of state said we are going to spend money now on to fight climate change. Not a single one. And you know, people said, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> you know, we're all done. Uh, and that was even before Trump. You know, and you know, at some point we we must be literate in economics, we must be literate in many other things. Democracy cannot work if you don't have a minimum level of understanding. And I would say, I wrote that, you know, minimum level of, of respect for experts, even so the experts sometimes that, are, not, issue, are, not, are, are not perfect, to be honest, but, you know, still. Uh, but to some extent, it's the same with companies. I mean, citizens have a big role to play. You know, if you think that a company is not um, acting um, responsibly, behaving responsibly, either by uh, through taxes or by producing, I mean, emitting uh, CO2 emissions or not being um, uh, environmental friendly and so on. You can always use your, you know, consumer power and not buy the goods. So, and in fact, the companies are probably very, very attentive to what uh, citizens and consumers uh, do in this respect. Some companies are actually more, are doing more in the area of um, what we call here the OECD responsible business conduct, which is more than um, um, so corporate social responsibility as has been done in the past, but really engaging in, like, you know, you have the Danone and so on, I mean, examples as always, but um, because the st it's, it pays. I mean, it's not pure altruism. It's also because it pays. I mean, they see, they see that they're, they get a return out of it because the citizens are more informed citizens and they will buy their products and services. Yes, sir, monsieur. Uh, hi, uh, I want to um, say uh, one question regarding what you said about uh, uh, global elites, uh, because we now have a problem in the, I think all the Europe uh, European and uh, Western world countries with how to tax the rich, the rich uh, part of the society, because as you said, they are traveling, so uh, if you try to in impose on them an income tax, they also, there's not uh, targeting them, and uh, the the side uh, effect is we are uh, targeting middle class by the income tax and so on. We are widening the, the, the gap, the, uh, the difference between the uh, richest and the uh, poorest in the society. So uh, what do you think is the future for uh, taxation on the, on, on the rich uh, to, to do it in the level and in the, in the way that we wouldn't hit accidentally the middle class or the poor? This is not um, 
Obviously, it's not an easy question. Some um, some people have said that you, it, I mean, if you look at uh, taxation sort of approaches or theories, it's, it's easier to tax the um, non-mobile um, um, assets, or um, because if it's mobile, for cap if it's capital or if it's uh, labor elites, they can m go away and then optimize um, their taxation rates. So uh, some people have uh, argued that you should tax um, land, for instance, or um, you know houses and the sort of thing that you can cannot take away. But certainly that's probably um, not sufficient. Um, the other thing is, of course, that you can also look at, um, I mean, the, if you look at the rich, richest, richest, the 1%, um, most of their um, income is in the form of capital gains uh, rather than um, salaries or other form of, of, of incomes. And there, this is where, again, the sort of, which they detain in, in um, companies, for instance. And so that's where multilateralism and the sort of activity that we do here at the OECD through BEPS, um, which, by the way, affects both um, companies but also individuals, this is how you can, you can reach out to these um, people. There was a question on the universal income just recently. Is that a concept that would be relevant in, in, or would it be good to implement it? Well, I'm not an expert in taxes. Uh, I th well, what is it that when we talk about universal income, we don't really know because uh, every country has that already in a way or the other. You have a minimum wage already, for instance. So the question is uh, what uh, level should it be and uh, how much uh, should you get if you return to work? And then the, then this is a, it's an empirical question of, as to whether we can afford such and such a level of income. Now, the the idea of uh, having everyone uh, benefiting from a minimum wage is not something that is very controversial. Now, should it be 1,500 euros or 2,500 euros? Here we're talking about uh, public finance, and we have to do calculation. And, and experimenting is not very easy, you see, because the, you, we could say, okay, let's experiment with this in Bordeaux, for instance. But uh, then, of course, it would affect uh, the uh, income structure, the social contributions, and so on. And so we would be challenging the whole system, and so it would be completely uh, uh, um, unequal uh, to, to do this on a sample. But that would be the solution, to actually play with it, exper experiment with it. Well, we could try and do it in Monaco. No, well, there's a country that did it, uh, Finland, and they've just uh, given up. Oui, bonjour. Uh, Good afternoon. I have a question. You mentioned the growth in inequalities, and uh, I was wondering what you think about the business model where each uh, uh, employee would have a share of the company. Do you think this is a viable model? And uh, do you think that this uh, would uh, help uh, reduce some of the inequalities? Well, it already exists in a number of sectors, uh, highly uh, qualified sectors. There are partnerships and that kinds of thing. Uh, so we could replace fixed wage uh, with a stake in the company uh, or profit sharing, could be profit sharing. Uh, the question with this is, okay, that there would be a, a clear benefit to this. It would uh, in, uh, uh, associate or uh, involve uh, people in the, in, the, in the company profit, so they would be more loyal to the company. But there's a risk, and we saw this with Enron. If people start putting uh, all of their money in the company, their savings uh, disappear when the company disappears. So there's a question of risk-taking here, which is maximum. Uh, so it's really a problem. So you can do a little bit of that, certainly, to uh, involve the, uh, the, the employees and uh, um, share some of the profit of the company with them. But there is the, the, this risk, which is highly correlated to their uh, employee status. And so this might lead to some other problems. OK, we have time for one more question, I think. So go ahead. 
what you talked about the Paris Agreement as non-binding. Uh, we had a binding agreement before, which was the Kyoto Protocol. In the context of the Paris Agreement, we have uh, more of a procedure. We have to uh, be accountable uh, and uh, we to know what's going to come out of it. We have to wait a little bit more. But uh, uh, isn't this uh, actually the, the problem uh, with the multilateralism? Well, Kyoto was not uh, completely binding because a number of countries were, came out of it and a number of countries were exempted from it, which was a mistake in my opinion. You have to have the courage of being generous vis-a-vis -vis southern hemisphere countries, but uh, generosity does not mean that they can pollute as much as they want. Uh, uh, so the idea would be to give them direct transfers. Uh, more uh, That would be what generosity is about rather than encouraging them of producing carbon. Uh, now, uh, my point of view, well, with Trump's uh, election, you know, it would have collapsed anyway. But uh, my p point of view is that uh, at COP21, we wanted to have everyone on board signing the agreement, which means that from the start, you know, there would be no constraint on these countries. Not saying that it was not difficult. Of course, as a negotiator, I would have found it very difficult to get to an agreement. But uh, if you want to have Venezuela and Saudi Arabia as signatories, you know that there'll be nothing in the agreement that will have a major impact on uh, uh, the uh, fight against uh, climate change. So I'm not saying it's, it's easy. I'm not saying I would have done better. But uh, uh, being so triumphant, you know, in December 2015 was a bit shocking, I found. Yeah, you never listen to the experts enough. Uh, Martin Durand, Jean Tirol, thank you very much for your participation this afternoon. Thank you very much for attending the forum session. Um, there will be a press event in here. Uh, we need to, if you want to continue your conversations, we thank you for moving out into the Discovery Lab area. Thank you again. Have a great evening.